Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for participating in the Washington State Department of Agriculture's first ever <laughs> virtual press conference. My name is Carla Selp, and I'm the public engagement specialist with WSDA and an agency spokesperson on the Asian giant hornet and our agency's response to it. I'll be moderating today's press conference. Today we'll be hearing from Sven Spieschiger, Managing Entomologist for the Department and the Lead Entomologist for the Agency's Asian Giant Hornet Response. In a few moments, Sven will give an overview of the new Asian Giant Hornet detection in the state and what this means for WSDA's response. First, a few reminders. In order for the best video quality for our speaker, participants are asked not to connect using their webcam. After Sven has provided some basic information, we will open up for questions. To ask a question, please use the raise your hand function, and I will call on you and unmute your line so that you can ask your question. Alternatively, you can submit a question using the chat function, and I can ask the question for you. We do ask your patience as this is our very first virtual press conference, and so we may experience some bumps as we are working through technology. And we do um, hope to make a recording of this press conference available this afternoon, if all goes well. I would also like to point you to some helpful resources before we begin. Information about Asian giant hornets can always be found on WSDA's website at agr.wa.gov slash hornets. In addition to our website, you can subscribe to WSDA's news releases, blog, and the pest program email listserv to re receive alerts about Asian giant hornets. Links to all of those resources are available on our website, or you can contact me directly and I can send you links to sign up. We did issue a press release earlier this morning that is also available on our website. Finally, I would like to mention that Joel Nielsen, who originally submitted the report and provided the photograph that we shared in the news release, has requested that the media and others not contact him or his family. We are sharing his request and hope that you will respect the wishes of Mr. Nielsen and his family. All right, with that, I'm going to unmute Sven, who just went, Sven, can you raise your hand so I can find you? because you just went way down the list. <laughs> All right, that didn't work. Let me find it one second. It's one of those little bumps we're working through here. There you go. Oh, you were unmuted. Sorry, Sven. All right, you should be ready to go. I'll mute myself. Great. Thank you, Carla, and thank you everybody for taking a few minutes out of your day to uh, hear the updates that we have. So, first of all, my name is Sven Spieschiger. I'm the managing entomologist with the Washington State Department of Agriculture. Uh, I am the uh, lead entomologist for the agency's response uh, to Asian giant hornet. Uh, as most of you know, uh, we first detected Asian giant hornet in the United States uh, back in December of 2019, and we have been planning. Uh, pretty intensive survey and eradication activities here for 2020. Uh, on May 27th, uh, we received a report into our Hornet Watch report form, and uh, this was accompanied by a, an excellent photograph of uh, what appeared to be an Asian giant hornet. Uh, because we were already planning activities in the area, we did have one of our other entomologists uh, um, uh, be available to go up and pick up the specimen yesterday, which was the uh, 28th of May. We were able to confirm this here and then send it through our verification process, which in involves the uh, WSDA's APHIS laboratories. And uh, we received confirmation back uh, earlier this morning that it was in fact Asian giant hornet. Uh, preliminary results indicate that this is a, a queen, uh, but that is, um, going to be unofficial and pending uh, further investigation at the lab in DC. And uh, what that means is more than likely uh, a nest was able to uh, produce breeding queens and make it through the winter. Uh, the location of this event is a, a few miles north of Custer, Washington, which is up near the Canadian border. It also happens to be about one mile north of where we had a suspect bee kill that we reported on earlier last year. 
uh, in the Custer area. And it is about uh, 2.1 miles south of where the original detection happened last, uh, last December as well. So it was not unexpected that we found something in this area. And uh, what this means for us is that uh, we, fortunately, we have our survey grids right in the right place uh, because this is an area where intensive survey is planned throughout the rest of the year. Uh, with that, uh, Carla, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks Sven for that overview. Um, we'll be taking qu questions now from the news media. Again, please use the raise your hand function to ask a question. Um, I did think that was gonna pop you to the top of the list. It doesn't look like that happened, so I'll have to kind of scroll through and find you. So ask your patience with that. Um, I will call on you and unmute your line so that you can ask a question. Please state your name and identify the news organization that you are with. Alternatively, you can also submit your question to me again through the chat function. I do realize that we likely have some people on the conference here who are not with the news media, and you may also have questions. We ask that you please hold those questions at this time. Dr. Chris Looney will be presenting a webinar to the public with the Pacific Science Center on June 2nd, and we invite you um, the, the general public, if you're not a member of the news media, to participate in that free webinar and ask questions at that time. You can also reach out to us through our social media channels and I manage those and we'll be happy to um, get any questions to you through that mode as well. All right, with that, we will get started with questions. Just going to look through the list here and see who has a hand raised. I see a Cheryl with a hand raised. Cheryl, I'm unmuting your line. If you can go ahead with your question. Cheryl, maybe you don't know you have your hand raised. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go ahead and remute Cheryl. And doesn't look like I can put her hand down, apologies. See. Okay, we have Jeff on the line here. Jeff, I'm unmuting your line. I, I guess two quick questions. Uh, one, we had the sighting in December, as you mentioned, and now you have this one. Why is this one significant? And is it more so or less so than the last one? <clears throat> and uh, I, I guess the follow up to that is how do you feel or how do you see, how do you think, I should say, that uh, these Asian giant hornets are making their way now to North America and why Washington State? Okay, thank you. Um, so the first question, why would this uh, detection be more significant than the one in December? So in December, we uh, were able to obtain a worker and uh, another beekeeper was able to submit a worker and this happened in 2019. Uh, these are not breeding cast, and so there's always the hope that when something new comes to the country that it's not able to make it through our winter. Uh, clearly, when we see queens uh, likely emerging here in the spring, that means that uh, at least one nest went through and that at least uh, uh, this particular queen and another one, by the way, uh, just to the north of us in Langley, British Columbia, which was also... Um, uh, first uh, detection for Canada here in 2020. Uh, what that means is that uh, we know something made it through the winter and since colonies can produce a few hundred queens, uh, it means we probably have a few more to look for as well. And so that's why it's significant. Um, could you please repeat the second part of your question? I'm sorry, Jeff, I muted you. Let me unmute you again. There you go, Jeff. I guess uh, from your studies, what's the vector? How how did these hornets get here, uh, and why Washington State? Sure. Um, so we're never actually going to know uh, how exactly they got here, but the most likely route is through international trade. Uh, there's a vibrant uh, port system here, uh, both in British Columbia and in Washington State, and uh, there's quite a bit of trade that comes from uh, the Far East, where these are native. And it's entirely possible that an overwintering queen uh, was able to stow away on either cargo or some kind of container and uh, make its way here to Washington. That's the most likely explanation. Okay, thank you. Next question will be um, Matt Smith with Cairo. Matt, you are unmuted. 
Thank you. Sven, I'm just curious at this point, uh, seeing a queen this early in the year, I know you guys were talking about uh, doing trapping starting in June, I believe. I, I just want to know if this changes your sense of the ability that you guys can eradicate an invasive uh, at this point. Does this change any of your planning, your thought, your confidence level at this time? Okay, uh, thank you. So, first of all, 2020 has uh, been looked at by us as uh, the season to figure out what exactly we're dealing with. Uh, getting two specimens or finding out about two specimens late in December gives us not a lot to go with. Uh, so, knowing that there are queens in the area just solidifies our resolve, if you will, that we need to have massive trapping and eradication efforts uh, ready to go for 2020. And so, from that perspective, it doesn't change it at all. Uh, from another perspective, uh, we have, uh, you know, advice from our counterparts in Europe who are dealing with a different species, which uh, established and spread very quickly. It's disappointing to know that they can make it through the winter and survive here in uh, Washington state. And so from that perspective, it's, it's depressing, but it doesn't really change uh, what we intend to do. And our thought that we still have a chance to eradicate this because. Uh, obviously, now that people are looking for it, it's very easy for them to turn in. Uh, it's not something that people would have missed and nobody turned any of these in until last year. So uh, it is my belief we're still very early on for any sort of a, um, an infestation, which gives us an excellent opportunity to uh, use everybody's eyes and ears, find out where it is and wipe it out where we find it. Great, Spin. Matt, and I see that you have um, a quick follow up. I saw someone, I heard someone's voice. Everybody should be muted and I'll unmute you when um, you're called on again. Use the raise your hand function or send a note in the chat. Also, um, once your question has been answered or if you no longer need to ask a question, if you just hit the uh, ask a question button again, it will unmute you. So Matt, I saw you had a follow up question. I'm gonna let you go ahead and do that. And I do want to ask you as well, as far as tracing goes, uh, I, I know that that's going to be a big part of this as well, especially when you talk about uh, hundreds of queens potentially. How confident are you guys about the ability to trace at this point? Where are you guys at in terms of how that would look? Okay, so tracing, I, I view that two ways. So uh, a colony goes through its life cycle, a bunch of queens emerge and disperse and overwinter. That's one type of tracing. That is what we're doing now. We're using a lot of outreach, a lot of eyes and ears from the public, uh, plus our own surveyors will be starting up very soon. So that's tracing type number one. Uh, number two is when the traps that are deployed starting in July, actually, I'll, I'll correct that, uh, those target workers, and uh, that's going to allow us to find new colonies that have established this year. Uh, we're actually going to be working with uh, University of Washington uh, uh, using some new technology where we will we will actually be trapping some of the hornets live should some be discovered and uh, we'll, we'll actually be able to follow them back to the nest and that's going to be uh, something uh, that's uh, kind of exciting to use. Uh, Chris Looney, who's also on this call, uh, he's going to be testing uh, basically some dummies uh, in, the, in the very near future here. And uh, we're going to make sure we can get that technology to work uh, before we have to use it using some of our native species uh, to see if we can follow them back to their nests. But uh, this has been successfully used in Europe. And so we have no reason to believe that it won't work very well for us here. Great. Next question is going to be from, I'm sorry, I'm going to butcher this name, but uh, Kai or Key Relea. I'm muting your line if you realize the name I just butchered. Okay, moving on, we have um, Michael Crow. Um, you are unmuted. Hey there, thanks for, for explaining this here. Uh, one point of clarity that I just was hoping you could repeat and then a question just, so it was one queen discovered in Whatcom County and you're saying the most recent find in DC was also a queen. Uh, and then I'll just ask you as well. So I noticed in the release uh, that was sent out, the quote from, USDA says there's no evidence that Asian giant hornets are established in Washington state or anywhere else in the US. But now if you're talking about queens here over winter, if not now, what is the bar to call them established if there are queens here? Okay, so 
uh, the life cycle of a colony basically has uh, the mating casts uh, emerging in, in the fall, and then several of them will overwinter as fertilized queens, and these will either establish or just simply die out, and it's a very low percentage of survival. So as of right now, we have captured presumably an emerged queen. We have no idea whether she actually started establishing a nest or if she was even fertilized. The same is true of the British Columbia um, in her, uh, detection there the other day. Uh, now, what the bar would be for knowing that we have an established nest is if we start pulling in workers. Uh, if we start pulling in workers in the traps, then we'll have some clue that some colonies have managed to establish. Does, I hope hopefully that answers your question. Great, thanks, Sven. Let's see. Scroll down here a little bit further. Okay, let me. I'm gonna look through the chat questions. Sorry. Steve asks, should there be any concern at this point that the Asian giant hornets have now been established in Western Washington? I think we might have um, just answered that, but do you have any additional comments about that, Sven? No, just that. Uh, we're all very interested in this question and uh, the trapping that we do throughout this season is really going to tell the tale there. And uh, so the more uh, the more results we can have and the more reports coming in from the public are really going to help to answer that better, if you will. But as of right now, it's not firmly established here in Washington state, but uh, we're concerned. Great. I believe that is, oh, Susan, you just, I saw your hand come up here. Susan, you are unmuted. Thank you. Uh, would you clarify, please, what is going on in Canada? Do you think that they also, uh, they have a more established or a, a infestation, or are they also at about the same stage at the U.S.? And do you expect any cross-border movement? Okay, uh, thank you. Excellent question. Uh, so, first of all, they did actually uh, find and eliminate a nest in September of last year in Nanaimo. And uh, had a, another photographic uh, detection in White Rock, which is very near the specimens we found in Blaine, um, but maybe far enough apart that it could have been from two separate areas. Uh, something that's uh, very interesting about this is that the nest from Nanaimo, uh, we had DNA from that uh, uh, specimens from there, and we also sent DNA from our specimens in Blaine. And our preliminary results are indicating that they are two separate introductions completely from two different countries. And so uh, we're, we're not so much worried about uh, those two being related as we are making sure that all of us are kind of working in conjunction uh, to do extremely good surveillance this year. And uh, our counterparts in Canada have assured us that they're on top of this as well. We do uh, meet with them every other month or so uh, to discuss uh, what activities are going on uh, since this has started. And uh, obviously we've been in touch with them last week because of their detection. So it, it, it may or may not indicate that we have a large population uh, looming over both countries. Uh, but what we do know is uh, that we all need to be extremely vigilant and make sure that we're continuing our surveillance and uh, making sure uh, that both countries are working towards eradication if it's possible. All right, thanks, Sven. Need to scroll up here. And Doug, um, Douglas Main, you are unmuted. Great, thanks for your time. Um, yeah, this is Doug Main from Nat Geo. Um, just a clarification. So it sounds like, just uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. It sounds like it's almost certain that there it, there was a colony in the fall established um, that this queen came from, and this queen has been overwintering. Um, so as so, the, the new queens they come out. Um, in the spring or, or summer. And so do they move around a little bit before establishing a nest? My understanding was they kind of hunker down and then if they were fertilized, they, they start their nest and they can, they kind of stay put. Is that wrong? Or, cause I mean, so it sounds like it's almost certain now that, I mean, there is, there, there at least was a colony established and probably there are more, more new Queens that likely will start their own nest. 
Okay, um, so a couple of thoughts there. So it is extremely likely that there was a colony that was established somewhere near the Blaine area uh, in 2019 and that they went through their complete life cycle and that this queen may be from there. Uh, there is another likelihood that this is a brand new introduction of an overwintering queen from overseas. That is less likely. So um, we're proceeding like we had a nest established and we have to go find two or 300 queens and what became of them. That's, so that's the, uh, that's the stance we're taking uh, when we respond to it. Uh, the second question you had? Uh, yeah, can you see? I apologize, Doug, I accidentally muted you. You should be unmuted. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, the, the the question was just about their behavior. So the 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 queen, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I, the, the queens, uh, they you know they disperse in the fall and they they hunker down for the winter, um, and then do they move about around a bit before establishing a nest, or how does how how does that work? Yeah. So. Okay, so a uh, fertilized queen, uh, when she emerges, uh, will start founding a new colony, and she's going to have to do most of the work until the first several workers are sort of ready to go. And so, yes, uh, early on in the spring here, you can expect that a fertilized queen and even unfertilized queens will be out and about kind of doing their thing. Um, and then around uh, early summer, there will be some new workers established, and they will gradually take over all of the work activities, and then the queen will stay within the colony. Hope that clarifies and answers for you. That clarifies, but if you can still hear me, um, so if it's not for if she wasn't fertilized, um, presumably then she would uh, d die or yeah. yes, uh, she would hang around. She would try feeding and stay alive as long as possible, but then will eventually die out. And so, whenever you encounter a queen in the spring that has emerged, do you have a fifty-fifty chance as to whether or not she can uh, establish a colony and then? Uh, according to the literature, the ones that are fertilized, a small percentage of those are actually successful. So, and they would be dying around now. I mean, the fact that it was found dead, it looks like you know well, it wasn't eaten or anything. Does that give us any more insight into what how it might have died and ended up on the road there? Uh, we can only speculate. Uh, I think the actual original report said maybe it had been hit by a slow-moving car, which oh. uh, is an unusual detail to receive in an initial report. But uh, it was a it was enjoyable to read anyway, but uh, yeah, we, we would only be speculating as to why it was dead. And will further work show if it was fertilized? Yes, uh, so the specimen right now is at our regional USDA lab and it is being forwarded to DC where they will do an autopsy uh, to get those specifics uh, should the specimen still be in good enough shape to do that. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and move on. I wanna, um... Ashley Anderson asked a question, what should the public do if they think they find one? Should they try and kill it? I'm assuming this information to the public will help the efforts of eradication. Uh, well, actually they should do exactly uh, what Mr. Nielsen, Nielsen's mother and Mr. Nielsen did. Um, so the, the most important thing to do is to report it to uh, WSDA. Uh, that's gonna give us a record that you have seen something if it is safe for you to do so, you should try to get a photograph. We are not recommending that anybody try tangling with a live hornet. Um, uh, although they're not uh, um, mean or uh, you know interested in going after you by any stretch of the imagination, uh, if you bother them, they will defend themselves. And so we don't uh, recommend anybody go after a live one. If it is found dead, we absolutely would like you to save the specimen for us uh, because we will send somebody out the next day as we did in this case and uh, earlier in December and uh, make sure that we can verify the find. So that that is the most important thing for the public to do is to report it if they believe they've seen it. Great, thanks, Sven. Uh, Bellamy, I am unmuting your line so you can ask your question. Thank you. I just wanted to ask, um, can you sort of Talk about this in terms of what it represents for you that you found this queen at this time. What is she likely attached to? I mean, what's your best guess as to what what is underground or out there as you do this work, having found this one specimen? And I have a follow up question after that as well. Great. Okay. So um, 
I, I actually debated whether to call this a detection or a nest eradication. So when you remove a queen, you're basically killing the nest, especially this time of year. So we can kind of count this as a, a victory. We've, uh, you know, through a collective effort and, you know, from our citizen scientists who are helping out, located and destroyed a potential colony. And that's uh, makes us all very happy here. Uh, but it means, uh, like I had mentioned earlier, that there are potentially more in the area. Uh, fortunately, this was an area that was already gridded out for pretty intensive survey. And so from that perspective, uh, it just means we we need to keep up with that effort and make sure it's completed as uh, as efficiently and as professionally as possible so that we can find anything else that might be around in the area. And then your follow-up question? Yeah, and my other question was just now, if you went along this summer and didn't find anything in this area, what would that mean? What, I mean, is that even possible given, given what you know now? Um, it is possible, but it's not likely. Uh, we will probably find a few nests in the area is my anticipation. Uh, again, we're, we're speculating. Uh, we're still very early on in this. We have a few dead specimens that have been detected here in Washington now. Uh, we now have a very tight survey grid up and we have a lot of great citizens helping out with reports. And that's going to tell us whether or not we have something in the area. If we find nothing uh, throughout all of these efforts that are going on, that is excellent news. Um, from a regulatory standpoint, I have to do that for three years before I can find, before I could call the area free of the pest. And so uh, that's kind of the benchmark that we need to meet for trade purposes and legal purposes and everything else. For an area to be declared free, I have to have three years of negative surveys. Great, thanks, Sven. It's gonna go back through the chat questions again. Um, Guard Otis said, there are two species of Asian giant hornets. Can you verify it was Vespa, Vespa mandarinia? Okay, um, so a clarification, there's uh, 23 Vespa species in the world. Um, Asian giant hornet, there's only one species. There's a few uh, subspecies uh, that are recognized and uh, it is definitely Vespa mandarinia. That's, uh, that's, that was confirmed by all three labs uh, over the last couple of days here. And uh, that's definitely what we're dealing with. Um, there's a few others that you may run into in the media. In Guam, for example, Vespa orientalis, or the oriental hornet, uh, has been established there. And in Europe, Vespa veliatina, which is called the uh, Asian hornet. So not Asian giant hornet, just Asian hornet. Uh, unfortunately, we get the large one here in uh, Washington. Uh, that one is running rampant in Europe right now. But uh, yes, I can confirm that we have Vespa mandarinia or the Asian giant hornet. Great, thanks, Sven. Um, I'm gonna ask this next question and then just a note to others on the line. I think I've gotten everybody who had their hand raised. If I did miss anyone or you do have another question, please send it in the chat just to let me know that you're still waiting to ask a question. So um, Jeff had asked, you mentioned eradication efforts. What would that entail? Okay, uh, so what the plan is, obviously we have quite a bit of surveillance going on. When something is detected, we will start establishing more traps uh, directly where uh, the detection has been made. Uh, and we're talking about workers for now. Uh, we will try to follow one of the workers back to the nest. Uh, we have some technologies at, uh, we can use to our advantage. Uh, we will then work with the property owner where the nest is located. Uh, we will don our very exciting looking hornet suits and we will get in there and eliminate the nests as they happen. We will then extract them, uh, count the number of cells and, and do all the other fun things we need to do to understand exactly how far along that particular nest was. Uh, but, but that is the plan for now. Wherever they are encountered, uh, WSDA intends to track them back to their nests and eliminate the nests. And those are the eradication activities that we have planned for 2020. Thanks, Ben. It looks like Bellamy has another question. And since we were able to unmute her earlier, I'm going to unmute her again so she can ask it. Oh, I was just going to ask, um, you know, people, I'm noticing a real fascination with this story right now amid the pandemic, maybe also just like another sign of, uh, and it's a very scary looking bug for some people. 
Um, but I'm wondering for you as an entomologist, what is the thing that scares you most about it? Oh, just the potential it has to uh, eliminate otherwise healthy honeybee colonies in a few hours. Um, I'm also a, a, a hobbyist beekeeper in my spare time, and you know it's it's very hard right now just to get uh, a honeybee hive through uh, the winter and healthy and producing honey and pollinating your garden. And uh, we have a lot of folks uh, who run apiaries as a business and as pollinators. And the fact that there's just one more thing to deal with to me is the scariest thing of this, uh, uh, you know, altogether. Uh, generally speaking, I, I don't think I want to get stung by one or walk into a nest. I, I would not want to see, you know, um, uh, somebody out walking a dog or some hunters stumble into one and, you know, uh, just be unaware and be severely injured by them or, or even killed. I don't want to see that. But to me, uh, the scariest thing is the the impact this could have on our, you know, our managed pollinators. Jeff asked how the Asian giant hornet typically kills honeybees or other insects. Sure. So uh, two different types of feeding with uh, Asian giant hornet. Early on in the life stage, the workers will take out single insects. Uh, they will uh, basically dismember them and form them into a uh, uh, what's called a meatball. They will take this meatball back and feed it to the brood. And then the, the brood actually secretes something called hornet juice, which is really exciting and wonderful. And this is what the workers feed on. Towards fall, uh, as uh, they started to produce their breeding cast, they switch into uh, what Chris Looney has called in uh, previous broadcasts the slaughter phase. And this is the part that worries me the most is they will find something like a managed honey beehive. Uh, they will mark it, uh, recruit just a couple more uh, workers and a few Asian giant hornets will then uh, coax them out of the uh, honey beehive, uh, decapitate them leaving the dead bodies there and then spend the next several weeks uh, after killing the entire hive, usually with no losses, mind you. Uh, They'll spend the next couple of weeks taking the brood and the pupae uh, uh, back to uh, feed to their own nest. And so um, these are the types of feeding that they do, but uh, it's not just honeybees. They'll feed on other uh, insects that are native to here. And it, it could disrupt our ecosystem uh, slightly by adding this new predator to the mix. Thanks, Ben. Joe asks, they've been dubbed murder hornets in the media. Is that unnecessary sensationalism? Uh, in my opinion, absolutely. It's unnecessary sensationalism. Uh, that was first done in Japan several years ago. And uh, that, that one little snippet uh, appears to be very popular. Uh, it's unfortunate from my perspective because we we really want people to learn about it. And if you search murder hornet, you'll just get a you know a few articles that are recent. If you actually search under Asian giant hornet, uh, you're going to get a lot more information. And so we would prefer everybody would just use the term Asian giant hornet, or if they're real adventurous, the Latin name Vespa mandarinia. That's uh, that makes me happy as an entomologist, but uh, I, I'm cool with Asian giant hornet as well. Um, Susan was asking if you could share any more details about the actual find um, from this week. Um, such as? So she said it was lying in the road. Um, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, someone was out walking down a, a long driveway and found it lying in the road, uh, reported it to the Hornet Watch thing. That's, that's really all we know. We responded the next day. Um, was was there something specific you wanted to know? I think they're they're trying to respect the request of the person who found it to not be contacted to get those details. I, I don't think we have a tremendous amount of detail other than that they were out on a walk and and came across it. They did the right thing, took a took a photograph of it and also collected the specimen. So, I mean, that's the perfect response. So other than, you know, what they were chatting about on their little stroll, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I can I can walk you through the ID process if you want, but I, you know, uh, that's if you find that helpful. But uh, I think we covered that uh, it was verified early this morning. Uh, was it already dead? Uh, okay, yes, it was already dead when it was found. And then there's another question from Mike asking, do we, knew the po do we know the possible impact of AGH on other social wasps or non-social bees? 
Um, we assume it's going to be negative. Uh, you know, that's uh, most of the literature says, and, and most of the Vespa species will make use of other, uh, other insects and other social uh, hymenoptera or wasps and bees. Uh, we don't know if they will be taking out bumblebees or paper wasps or other parts of our ecosystem, but we assume that they will because they do in their native range. Thanks, Ben. And I know there was some questions about the um, quote from USDA about them not being established. Um, in general, can you give the folks a little bit more information just as an example? I work a lot also on gypsy moth and we've had gypsy moth in Washington state for over 40 years, but it's not considered established here because we continue to eradicate it. Can you um, provide any further explanation on that, or I will also be able to provide a USDA contact after the conference for folks that want to follow up with USDA. Sure, it's pretty dicey um, when it comes to sorting out the details here, but uh, in general, uh, uh, an insect is considered established when uh, multiple detections are made for uh, uh, consecutive years. And uh, that that would generally indicate we have evidence that it is established in the area. And when I mean multiple detections uh, with this particular pest, I mean we have found uh, workers, we have found colonies and nests, and uh, we find them consistently every single year. That is, that would be uh, the benchmark for establishment. Uh, right now, uh, we're right on the cusp of that. Uh, we're gonna find out from our survey work this year if we did have anything established. Clearly there was at least one nest, but uh, I mean, if you picture the scenario, uh, an overwhelming queen came on with a ship early in the spring, made a nest and went through and came through the winter. And then her queens went out and made more nests. That would be what we would consider established. We're not all the way through that story. We're only through the first part of it. We know that there was something um, that uh, occurred last year uh, at the earliest that we're aware of. Uh, could have happened earlier, but uh, from the information we have, we had at least one colony somewhere near the Blaine area that uh, kicked at least some workers out in December and appears to be responsible for at least one queen here and possibly another queen up in Canada um, early this year. And that's where we are right now. But uh, we'll keep everybody updated on what we find. Uh, I think we're uh, pretty transparent about uh, posting uh, our findings as quickly as we possibly can, so. Thanks, Ben. And I think this will be the last question. Um, they're sort of related to so somebody, um, Will Washington State be staging a quarantine on potted plants in nurseries or other commodities? What could that look like? Or could they possibly have been transported in wood products? Okay, um, yes, both of those are definitely possibilities. Uh, a quarantine, uh, we would have to wait and discuss that uh, a little bit further, but uh, I can tell you one thing we want to avoid is giving uh, anybody the opportunity to say, yes, I want Asian giant hornet to live on my property. Uh, so I can tell you we are looking into language that would allow us to eliminate colonies when they are found. Uh, that's what we're doing at this point. Uh, anything else, we would have to wait until we're a little further through the process to discuss that. Um, sorry if that that's not uh, quite the answer you were looking for at this time, but as of today, I can tell you I have not been called to conversations to quarantine potted plants. Uh, I've been called to conversations to make it illegal for people to harbor Asian giant hornet. That's what we are currently discussing. All the rest of that may come in time. It may not. Okay, I lied. There was one more question. Um, the uh, Bellamy asked, I hear there are, AG, uh, there are Asian giant hornet nests underground. Is Washington especially good habitat for them? Yes, um, definitely they are uh, known ground nesters. Uh, there are a few instances in the history of the literature where they were found in tree voids or in voids above ground, but uh, over 90% of the colonies described in the literature are uh, ground nesters. Unfortunately, uh, Washington State, particularly Western Washington, is ideal habitat for Asian giant hornet. Um, I know some folks are working on some modeling and some predictions for where this might spread to. And it seems uh, from early indications that the everything 
basically east of the Mississippi River would be ideal habitat and the Pacific Northwest, including Northern California, Oregon, and Washington also serves as excellent habitat for Asian giant hornet. Thanks, Ben. And one other question that I missed that was highlighted to me. Um, somebody wanted to get a better idea of what the timeline is on the trapping program. Sure. Uh, so because the workers are going to be most prevalent uh, starting in July, we are going to be starting the bulk of the trapping program in July. Uh, we have uh, made trapping instructions available and some people are very anxious and can't wait. And I'm not going to discourage them. I'm just going to put out the message that uh, the traps we have recommended are definitely made to target workers and the workers will not be really prevalent in the environment until about July. Uh, this is based on trapping data for similar species that we have done in the eastern United States, where most of the trap catches did not start happening until the first week of August. Uh, so by starting in July, we would get those that are kind of early risers, if you will, or if our environment here is slightly different uh, to account for that. But uh, the timeline for trapping really is July for us. Uh, there is some sense of urgency to get uh, positive trap results to us as quickly as possible. We do not want any nests to go through uh, to the point of uh, October or so when they start creating breeding cast and starting the next year's population. So we want to locate and eliminate as many nests as we can, uh, probably prior to the end of September. Uh, puts a lot of pressure on us, but uh, we're up for the task, we believe. Thanks, Ben. Okay, folks, that's going to be the end of today's um, virtual press conference. Thank you so much for participating. Unfortunately, our entomologist, Ben, and Chris Looney will, will not be available for additional interviews this afternoon or this weekend. However, if you need further information, I would be happy to assist you. I sent out my um, email there in the chat box and you can also find my contact information on the website or the another easy way is if you email hornets at agr.wa.gov that doesn't come to me directly but it will get sent to me um, we appreciate you covering the Asian giant hornet story and um, as Sven mentioned, public awareness is really going to be absolutely key for us. All of the reports so far have been from the public. So your assistance in helping us uh, educate people about Asian giant hornet how to and how to report them is really going to be critical um, for our potential to eradicate them. Um, from Washington State. Once again, thank you very much. We are um, hoping that the recording that we've made will turn out well and we will, <laughs> sorry, I just was obviously reading something and saw Sven's image pop up of the Asian giant hornet. Um, thanks, Sven. Uh, we will have this uh, recorded if it turned out well and we will upload it to uh, the agr.wadit.gov slash hornets webpage, as well as put a link to it in the press release, the online press release that came out. Thank you very much. Again, if you have any questions, you can follow up with me and I'll be happy to help you. Have a good day, everyone.